Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to the Old State House today for the taping of this special Veterans Day television program, which will air on the Connecticut Network on a really important topic, mental health care issues for the military and for our veterans, with a look at how these have played out over history. Mental health among the troops is a subject that has gotten more attention in the last few years. I think in particular in this area, what really brought the status of the current troops to my mind was a groundbreaking series by the Hartford Current that was published four years ago that talked about the high number of suicides with troops in Afghanistan. You've probably seen stories in the news since then about how the military has tried to cope with the stresses and strains of troops who are in combat conditions. I know that I've seen actually stories about battlefield clinics being set up to provide counseling for troops and trying to get them to admit when they're having a problem and to step forward and ask for some help and establish a safe place for them to go to look for help and support and counseling. But what happens when they get back? A recent study by a U.S. Senate committee showed that the veterans' hospitals lack the staff and the space to meet the needs of veterans who seek treatment. And what about the veterans who never ask? It takes courage for a warrior to ask for help. As our main speaker today, Connecticut State University Professor Matt Warshower says in his recent book, Connecticut and the Civil War, we have only recently come to understand the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder. Before Vietnam, it was known as shell shock or battle fatigue and by other names. During the Civil War, a syndrome like this was known as soldier's heart. How did these men survive? Did they receive treatment and resume full lives after coming back from the war? That's something that Matt and his students have been looking at as Connecticut commemorates the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. In a few minutes, we're going to be joined by two other panelists, including the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs, and we hope that you will also join in our discussion. But first, an historical analysis by Central Connecticut State University and the Chairman of the Connecticut Commemoration Commission, Professor Matt Warshow. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. I know uh, I, I sent out uh, somewhat jokingly an email to people yesterday, you know, letting them know that this was happening and asking if they were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder due to the storm. So uh, I, I know difficult difficult to get out today. But I am also, and Sally, I think, my friend Sally Whipple, who's the, 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 the um, education director here, would, would agree with my wife on this. I'm the perfect person to do this talk because they both question my mental health on a weekly basis. <laughs> so uh, I need to provide a caveat before beginning today and say that virtually everything that I have learned about post-traumatic stress disorder in relation to the Civil War, I learned through one of my graduate students, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Michael Sturgis, who is a high school teacher here in Connecticut. Uh, a couple of years ago, when we started this project, really about three years ago, he became interested for his graduate paper on doing, you know, researching post-traumatic stress disorder among Civil War soldiers. And I said, go for it, not really knowing what he would end up finding or where it would lead. And he has done absolutely tremendous work, learned, as I said, basically everything I know about the subject from him, from his paper. It has now become his master's thesis. And he has just been digging and digging and digging and finding out more and more information, which just allows the story to unfold uh, even further. So I'd like to begin by reading you something that is in the last chapter of my book. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Copperhilt was an English immigrant who joined the 15th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry and was discharged in 1864 due to insanity. He lived for a time at Fitch's Soldier's Home in Darien, Connecticut, the state and nation's first soldier's home. Copperhilt ultimately escaped the facility in 1884 and six years later was found wandering aimlessly near his former home. Diagnosed with imbecility, he was transferred to the Hospital for the Insane in Middletown, Connecticut, founded in 1868. He had been a carpenter before the war. James Herrick, a teacher, was discharged in January 1863 from the Connecticut Volunteer Infantry on the ground of insanity. He was treated at Fitch's home for mania and was transferred in 1891 to the Hospital for the Insane. He died soon after. 
Caleb Trowbridge was listed as an inebriate and was expelled from Fitch's home nine times for alcohol possession, opium possession, and behaving violently towards staff. During the periods when he was banned from Fritch's, Trowbridge was arrested four times. These stories are hardly unique, yet they are striking examples of what the toll of war has had on soldiers in the past. And, you know, you really need to understand the nature of the Civil War. And it's something that, you know, as many times as I've talked about it, it is still something that I am somewhat taken aback by, and that is just the sheer death toll. 620,000 Americans, both North and South, are killed in the American Civil War. That has been a working number for about the last 30 to 40 years. A new study just literally came out a few weeks ago that places that number more accurately at 750,000. That is more who have died than in any American war in history combined. So think about that death toll. Those are just who died. Now consider the well over one million who were casualties during the war but, but weren't killed. Those who returned home uh, as amputees, those who returned home, and you know, these are the physical ailments, but then think about what, how this affects people's minds. Uh, beyond just those who are killed and wounded, you have to consider that there's over 600,000 who uh, are, are held in prisoner of war camps, some for years at a time. Uh, the 16th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry is an outstanding example of this, where 400 of them are captured in April of 1864, uh, and at the end of the war they are released, only 200 of them survive. Uh, a friend of mine just finished a book on uh, the 16th Volunteer Infantry, and as we got talking about the subject over the last couple of years of post-traumatic stress disorder, she said, oh, oh, I'm very excited on the phone. She said, oh, I, I have a list of insane members of the 16th and literally sent me an Excel list where she had gone down and been researching their backgrounds and looking at their pension records to find out why, you know, what had happened to them and what their, the, the symptoms of, of PTSD was. So you know, wh wh what is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? It is a term that came about in around 1980, and it was directly related in the aftermath of Vietnam soldiers' experiences. And at the time, it was considered by many to be fairly unique to Vietnam soldiers. And that was really for two primary reasons. One was that uh, the, the kind of excesses of jungle warfare and how brutal jungle warfare was, that was one factor. The other factor was the political scope of the war, in that for one of the first times in recent American history, the nation had not been in favor of the war. They had not welcomed the troops home, that these troops from Vietnam came home to, uh, you know, a hostile uh, if you want to call it homecoming, uh, they were not welcomed home with open arms. It was not like World War II, and that this had a decidedly negative impact on their psyche and how they dealt with their experiences during the war. Now, as time has gone on and more study of mental health has gone on, more study of experiences of soldiers has gone on, and especially as the World War II generation and Korean War generations have have been aging and over the last 15 years started being more willing to tell their story, we've come to, to recognize pretty clearly that this is not unique to Vietnam. That as, as Diane had mentioned, that you look at uh, Korea, the Korean War, World War II, it's often referred to as battle fatigue or battle exhaustion. Uh, World War I, it's shell shock. Uh, so these, you know, I think one of the big differences is that the nature of society had changed. When men came home from World War Two, World War One, World War Two, Korea. There was still a, a kind of traditional sense of of manliness and masculinity, and that you didn't engage these subjects. But when you do look at the experiences or the the, the lives of veterans, you know there are plenty who uh, were alcoholics for the remainder of their life, and in many ways trying to you know really self uh, uh, medicate and and cope with. The, the traumas and the experiences that they had dealt with in war. And so, uh, 
you know, it's pretty obvious to us that post-traumatic stress disorder has been around for a long, long period of time. Uh, as Diane mentioned, during the Civil War, it was referred to as soldier's heart. And in a lot of ways, I think that's actually a more accurate description when you think about it. Post-traumatic stress disorder has such a clinical feel to it that, oh, it, we, we diagnose it, we can treat it. Soldier's heart, I mean, you think about what these guys went through, and, you know, in writing my book and reading so many soldiers' letters and diaries, uh, what these guys witness on at these various battles, uh, I don't know how the majority of them could come out not experiencing serious, serious trauma in regards to what they saw. I mean, you look at just a single battle during the Civil War, the, the, one, the really the bloodiest day in American history, the Battle of Antietam, September 17th, 1862. There are 23,000 killed and wounded in a single day. There are plenty of letters from soldiers throughout the, the conflict that talk about that in the aftermath of a battle, they could walk across the battlefield without ever touching the ground, just by walking from body to body. Uh, and then, of course, there is the question of, in the aftermath of the battle, if you were lucky enough to survive the battle, to not get shot down with your friends who are standing to your left and right, you get lucky enough to survive. Guess who gets the honor of burying all the dead. I have one quote in my book in which uh, a, a guy from the 14th Connecticut said that they spent so much time after the Battle of Antietam on burial detail that he said everything for the next few months, everything that I ate and drank smelled of death. And so how could that not affect your psyche, affect your outlook, affect your overall mental health? So uh, there has been very little in the way of study of this subject, however. Uh, especially as it relates back to the Civil War period. There is only a single book on the subject, uh, a book by a gentleman by the name of Eric Dean. He actually lives here in Connecticut. He is, uh, uh, I think, a patent attorney today, but he went to Yale University and wrote uh, a doctoral dissertation that ultimately became a book published in 1997 called Shook Over Hell, Post-Traumatic Stress in Vietnam and the Civil War. And he discussed the symptoms of post-traumatic stress that were diagnosed through the Vietnam War and then went backward and he looked at the medical records of 291 soldiers from Indiana, from a hospital in Indiana. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about law and mental health in, in, in a bit, but Indiana doesn't have any restrictive laws in regards to who can access these files. So he was able to go into the medical files and look at 291 sets of records and really see what the doctors were saying about the symptoms, about how they went about diagnosing. And so he did this really landmark study in the subject of post-traumatic stress disorder among Civil War soldiers. Um, very little else has been done. Last spring, a, a uh, video or a documentary came out by HBO called War Torn, which was 1861 to 2010. It was shown on HBO. Uh, I, the, the people, the producers who were actually working on that contacted me and wanted to know what we had found here in Connecticut. So we had some very interesting conversations and shared a lot of materials. Uh, I think I got the better end of it because I gave her a list of all of our soldiers and she went to the National Archives, copied all of their pension records and sent them to me. So I, it, it was, the, it was the, my ultimate example of what I say to my students of share the information you find because you'll get it back tenfold. And, but they found, uh, again, tremendous information about how long this history stretches back. Um, so, but, but the problem is, how do you take post-traumatic stress disorder and the modern clinical definitions and diagnoses of it and go backwards to kind of superimpose the terms we use today on that, this time period? The culture and society were different. The nature of medical treatment was different. Psychiatry in the 1860s was in its, was in its infancy. And so how do you go about that? I mean, there are only, in 1825, there are only six, or, or no, excuse me, nine institutions in the country specifically dedicated to mental illness. One of those is the Hartford Retreat, which is the Institute of Living as part of Hartford Hospital today. And we have Dr. Sarah Bullard, who will uh, be, you know, will, is our representative from Hartford Hospital. We'll talk a little bit about that. So you have very few places that are, that specialize in this subject. By 1865, there are, I think, 20 
uh, 25 institutions that are now dealing specifically with mental illness. But what do you do? Most of, and when you look at the diagnoses, most of them lump into three major categories. Mania, melancholia, dementia. Well, as I said, my wife and Sally Whipple would dis describe all of that for me. But what are the subsets of this? Now, here's the list. Mania, melancholia, dementia, nostalgia, mental paralysis, imbecility, insanity, nervous hysteria, nervous irritability, nervous disease, nervous exhaustion, nervous agitation, nervous disorder, I guess nervous was the uh, primary uh, the factor, norasthenia. I mean, so you've got all of these varying descriptions of what various patients, there's no really necessarily standardized model for how you deal with this. And a lot of it, the, the medical facilities at the time are attempting not so much to figure out the cause as to try and figure out a cure. Well, how do you, you know, the, the two need to fit together. And I think we'll talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder and how it's being treated today and understanding what the causes are. In the 19th century, they often viewed the causes as uh, either it was a, you know, physical damage to the brain. That's obvious. Okay? And, and that makes it much easier, because at least if you have a physical injury, they can look at it and go, aha, there's, this is an answer. But what if there's no physical injury at all? How do they go about determining what the causes of nervousness or insanity are? Uh, there are some doctors who theorize that it was an imbalance in the four bodily humors, and that if your humors were out of balance, then it's going to potentially affect your mind. So they used all kinds of things, and we've all heard of this, bleeding patients. I mean, all kinds of things that today we might view as rather bizarre were utilized to, to try and deal with these things. Um, you also have, uh, let me see where we are. You, you also have a, a view that it was a moral deficiency that it was the person's own fault, that they were immoral, and that's the cause of their insanity. Intemperate behavior, the idea that the use of, of uh, alcohol or other uh, you know, mind-altering substances was a cause of insanity as opposed to a means to cope with that insanity. So, I mean, a complete reversal of how we might think about the subject matter. Uh, so you know, it's very difficult, again, to take these modern diagnoses that we have and superimpose them over on the past. So how do we go about finding the information on Civil War soldiers? And we're talking about a long time ago, 150 years ago, to, to learn the stories of these soldiers. Well, there are some stuff that you can find in, of course, soldiers' letters and diaries or the letters and diaries of family members who say, you know, I, I actually was, when I was researching this, I had a woman contact me uh, from a town in Connecticut, and she said, oh, that we have stories in our family about a, a great-great-grandfather who was literally chained to the barn. He had served in the Civil War, and this is how the family dealt with him because they couldn't let him go. And this was, you know, oral tradition through the family. But are there more scientific ways to get at this information? And yes, there are. Pension records. Every soldier who received a pension from the federal government had to fill out a rationale for why they were receiving that pension or to advocate on behalf of getting a pension or receiving more money in terms of their pension. And quite often, these pension records provide a tremendous amount of detail on the conditions that soldiers suffered. We can also look at hospital records, if the hospitals are available. Eric Dean utilized hospital records from uh, Indiana. We have utilized some hospital records from here in Connecticut, which I'll talk about. Census records help us with this. Uh, there is also a surgical and medical history of the War of Rebellion which noted that out of 22 causes of disease in, among northern troops, nervous disease was ranked 10th. Insanity accounted for six out of every 1,000 soldiers who were discharged. Interestingly, however, after September 1863, field surgeons in the Union Army are no longer permitted to discharge soldiers based on insanity. And again, you have to think about this disparity between having a physical wound that someone can see and say, well, hey, you had your leg shot off. OK, you can go rest for a little while uh, versus somebody who is 
beside themselves or has nervous agitation. They were viewed as skulkers, as uh, malingerers, as people who weren't willing to fight, and they were basically told, maybe it's mental weakness, they were told, buck up, get your gun, go to the front. And so there's no even ability of, of Union surgeons to, to address the matter in the field after, after September of 1863. Well, one of the great resources for studying this subject in Connecticut was in relation to the 1880 state census that was done. There was also supplemented by what was called a census of defective, dependent, and delinquent service uh, uh, persons, where they actually went out and did a survey of those who were viewed as defective or delinquent and went out and really researched what their symptoms were, where they were housed. So this has provided a lot of information to us. In 1883, Connecticut commissioned a census of its disabled veteran petitioners. So all of those veterans in the state of Connecticut who were receiving a petition, a, a pension were actually, they went out and surveyed them and wrote all of this stuff down. This has been a huge source for us in terms of defining what this subject matter is, how many suffered, what their conditions were. Well, this 1883 uh, commission, uh, the census, revealed a few things for us. The list revealed that there were some 65 men in Connecticut who suffered from PTSD-like symptoms. 55 of these men were listed as suffering from, you guessed it, nervous disorder. Six of the 65 uh, had insanity listed specifically as their ailment. Okay? So this gives us a little bit of insight, but not everybody is going to be reached by a census or by a survey. I mean, not everybody even fills out the census that goes around every 10 years as it is in the 21st century. So how are you going to get a track of all of these people? Where, where else can we look? We can look at the records of Fitch's Soldiers Home which is the very first, as I mentioned earlier, the very first soldier's home founded in the state of Connecticut, the very first founded in the nation. It was the model for what is today our modern VA system. And our, our Commissioner of Veterans Affairs, Linda Schwartz, Linda Schwartz, is here today. She is uh, located at Rocky Hill, which is where the Fitch's Soldier's Home was transferred to. And so all of this came out of the Civil War period. And a number, you know, when we look at the records of Fitch's, uh, and they're they're, they're kind of piecemeal. We don't have a ton of them. But a lot of these records are transferred to Connecticut Hospital for the Insane, which is founded in 1868 in Middletown, Connecticut. It still exists there today. It is Connecticut Valley Hospital. And whenever I go into Middletown and drive through that campus, I see some of the old brick buildings there. And because I know this particular history, I can't get that out of my mind and seeing these buildings and thinking about just how many Civil War soldiers were housed there and how many of those soldiers were there specifically because of problems related to post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, we found, uh, or more correctly, Mike Sturgis, my student, found a specific transfer list at the State Library that was a transfer of 41 patients from Fitch's Soldiers Home to Connecticut Hospital for the Insane. And it listed why they were sent there. And most of it was, you know, you know, was described within this long pantheon of diagnoses that I've already listed out to you. So this, you know, based on all of these records, we can tell a lot more. So once Mike found out that all of these, uh, these soldiers had been transferred over to Fitch's Soldiers Home, or to, excuse me, from Fitch's to the Connecticut Hospital and for the Insane, we decided we want those records. So we contacted Connecticut Valley Hospital and said, we'd really like to see your records. And they said, no. And I wrote them then and said, no, 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 really, we'd like to see your records. Well, we wouldn't have any records like that. We sent them an Excel list with 130 names on it that said, all of these soldiers were housed at your institution. Again, we'd like to see your records. They again said, really, no. And now they're part of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And so we actually did a Freedom of Information Act request and said, we really want to see the records. They are not protected under the Freedom of Information Act. And we went back and forth with this. We finally had a full-blown hearing 
in front of the Freedom of Information Act Commission. And the argument was that all of these records, the argument of the, of the Attorney General who represented the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, their argument was that all of these records were protected under the doctor-patient privilege uh, statute that was passed in 1969. We went in with a very historical argument and said, your legislation doesn't work retroactively unless the legislature specifically states that this is retroactive. So the 1969 law does not apply. We said, furthermore, because the 1969 statute specifically designates licensed physicians in the state of Connecticut, we said, your statute does not apply because uh, uh, physicians in Connecticut weren't licensed until 1893. All the records we want predate that. We won the Freedom of Information Act case. <laughs> They turned over all of their patient books, all of their records, to the State Library. And Mike spent part of the summer, this past summer, going through all of these records. And they're very, very spotty and, and incomplete. A lot of the patient books were missing, but he found a tremendous amount of information. The story, however, doesn't end there. And I'm going to tell you this quickly, and then we're going to go to panel, because I really want to hear what, the, what, I, what our other panelists have to say. Uh, this past, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services was not happy about losing this case. And they pushed the matter through legislation. And they put forward a piece of legislation that would change the law. It never went anywhere until the last days of the last legislative session. And it got slipped into a bill that nobody really knew about. They didn't ask for any commentary or, 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 or you know, opinion from anybody who was involved in the case, except for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and the Attorney General's Office. And they changed the legislation. And not only did they change the legislation, but they did it retroactively so that it affects every single statute and all common law in the state of Connecticut. So they have closed records, and I just want to very quickly read this to you. It says, records tax returns, reports and statements exempted by federal law or state, the general statutes or communications privileged by the attorney-client relationship, marital relationship, clergy-penitent relationship, doctor-patient relationship, therapist-patient relationship, or any other privilege statute by the common law or the general statute, including such records, tax returns, reports or communications that were created, and this is the key, or made prior to the establishment of the applicable privilege under the common law or the general statutes. They've closed all of the records. They have, it's like dropping an A-bomb on an anthill. They have no idea what they've really done. Uh, they've closed historical research to historians of legal history, religious history, social history. They have no idea what they've done. And so we're trying to deal with this right now, but the attitude of, this, of the uh, state librarian and the state archivist properly is that they're required to follow the law, which went into effect on October 1st, 2011. Interesting, isn't it? All right. I did not know the end of the story, but I just like to ask that as well. Um, that's something that we may have to follow up on. I didn't know the end of the story until uh, a journalist contacted me and said, hey, do you know the end of the story? And he had written about it, and I had no idea. And as soon as I looked it up and saw what the language was and how they had changed it, I mean, they even ex the original legislation they were going to put in place, they even changed that and expanded it even further to outlaw all of these records. It's, you know, what they really should have done is put a 75 window. I understand that they were trying to protect the records of, of veterans who are living now, which I think is tremendously important. But a 75-year window like the National Archives does would have fit the, the bill.
Well, Matt, as uh, anybody who watches the legislature will tell you, the most dangerous things happen in the last few That's days. That's exactly. It's the last few hours. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that you're all here for the taping of this special program that's going to air uh, this week for Veterans Day and then many times thereafter on CTN and will also be available for download. So if you have friends who are interested in this subject, uh, perhaps veterans groups that you might be part of, please let them know that they'll be able to watch it at ct-n.com or on the air. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Commissioner Linda Spoonster Schwartz. Thank you so much for being here. She has served as Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs since 2003. In 1863, Connecticut began its service to veterans. Dr. Schwartz is the first woman in our history to be appointed to administrate those programs. Dr. Schwartz is. Um, she has a doctorate in public health, that's why I'm calling her doctor. She is also a nurse and served as a nurse, um, but Dr. Schwartz was a member of the U.S. Air Force from 1967 to 1986, served on active duty and as a reservist. She retired in 1986 after sustaining injuries in an aircraft accident while serving as a U.S. Air Force flight nurse, and she holds the rank of colonel on the governor's military staff. And thank you so much for being with us. Always good to be here. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Bullard is our other panelist and she is a neuropsychologist on the staff of the Hartford Hospital Institute for Living, which, as Matt mentions, was one of the earliest uh, places for treatment of mental illness in this country. Dr. Bullard is a licensed clinical psychologist with clinical interests including dementia and traumatic brain injury. She consults with patients on a variety of issues in both English and Spanish and supervises the training of postdoctoral fellows in clinical neuropsychology. Um, Commissioner, I'd like to start with you. Um, um, these days, many of us in our society are more, uh, of, more able to talk about mental health issues. But I wonder, how about combat vets? Is it very hard for a soldier to say, I need help? Yes, it is, because, you know, the soldiers are macho. Even the women are macho. Uh, and so asking for help is particularly difficult in this day and age because we make a big issue of these are our heroes, these are your war fighters. Um, and the other part of that is because we rely so heavily on the Guard and the Reserves, many of them are still in the military and they're afraid if the uh, information gets out that they will not, first of all, the most important thing is they don't think that the other people they serve with will trust them. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is they feel that they will not be promoted. So um, part of the, um, even though, and I would like to say this on behalf of VA, the federal VA, our Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, Secretary Shinseki himself, a combat veteran and uh, chief of the Army, has stopped calling it post-traumatic stress disorder. He calls it post-traumatic stress because I'm sure you would agree it is a natural reaction to a very abnormal situation. And there is nothing more abnormal than people trying to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. You can accept snowstorms and hurricanes as acts of God. So it's very hard to say that people will go to war and not be changed by it. They will be. And this, um, this kind of idea that I am too strong uh, is, um, is probably one of the greatest barriers to care. Right now, because many of the people who are serving have families, we know, especially here in Connecticut, what uh, ramifications there are for the family unit. And so we have been working very hard to do outreach and try to get the families to come to therapy together. And we have a very great program in this state. It's called the Military Support Program. It is, we went to, is co-sponsored by, actually, Demas is the lead. Mm -hmm. But we have trained over 300 clinicians, mental health clinicians throughout the state mm -hmm. in towns and cities. And they have formed a cadre of people who, uh, we actually gave them kind of an in, in, initiation into the military, but they are willing to, to see the military member, their families, their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, their children, and their significant others. It's a 24 hotline, 24 seven hotline. And uh, the nice thing about it is, is if the folks don't have the money to pay for the care, uh, Connecticut has set aside 
the funds to reimburse the clinician. Commissioner, um, and I want, uh, Matt, I want you to comment on this, too, because you brought this up and I've been thinking about it. Um, how much of a difference do we think it makes, and maybe there's no way to know, about the political ramifications of a war. If you go off to World War II and the you know whole nation is united behind you and you feel that you're going off to do something that's going to save the world for democracy, are you less likely to come back with a problem than if you go to a war that people don't necessarily support or that people now think maybe it should be time to bring everybody back and how successful are we? You know, how much does that play into how people suffer later? That's a really good question, and I don't know exactly the answer to it. I mean, I, I would, my, my instincts would tell me that, of course, it's going to affect people. They want to have support, that, that um, you know, that kind of moral support that comes along with this. I had a very interesting conversation with one of my classes a, a couple of years ago on the anniversary of September 11th, and we had a, a, a young man in the class who had done two tours in, in uh, the Marine Corps in Iraq, and we were discussing the idea of supporting the troops but not supporting the war. And his view, which was very interesting, the first time I'd ever heard anybody say it, he looked at all the students, and it was a very cordial, respectful conversation, but he said, you can't support the troops if you don't support their mission. And it brought up all kinds of you know, interesting comments and ideas. So yeah, I think there's a lot to that. I would just say, I, as you know, I served during the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, there was a time that I was not allowed to wear my uniform on the streets of America. Um, it, is, it was something you didn't talk about, and uh, most recently uh, we, we have been talking about the fact that in this state we have 612 who died in, uh, they were killed in action in Vietnam, and uh, there were no funerals like there are today because if we had lowered the flag as we do in respect for our fallen today, that flag would have been at half-mast for eight and a half years. So the families were left to grieve and sometimes hide uh, because of the attitude of people. So when you think about those who have survived, I just give you this idea, and it's a, it's a very startling uh, fact. 8.2 million Americans served in uniform during the Vietnam War. About three, maybe 3.2 or 3.6 around there actually served in uh, Vietnam. And the VA budget was not increased by a dollar when they came home. And many of them had to even fight to be taken care of that they were casualties of the war. So, yes, I do believe that that wears heavy. It still obviously wears heavy on my heart because I was a nurse who was trying to help them. Mm -hmm. But I think there is another thing that emerged from this, and that was the fact that the brothers and sisters that I served with during Vietnam made a pact that never again would this happen to a generation of soldiers. So let me just say this, that we take great joy out of seeing our men and women in uniform walking the streets of America because we know perhaps America has learned and will never, I mean, you can talk about the mission, but the men and women who go to war, they actually, it ends up being, they are for each other. They're out there, they're just trying to stay alive. And the, the mission may not be the first thing they think of in the morning, but staying alive with their mates is. Mm -hmm. well, Dr. I, think, I, I think I would add to that, too, in that I think if you have a, a culture in which you're supported, it's going to impact perhaps the treatment and the success of the treatment, mm -hmm. but you may still have the same number of people certainly suffering. If, you are, if your uh, compatriot is, is killed next to you, you're still going to, regardless of whether the country is behind you or not behind you, you're still going to have the effects of PTSD. Right. Right. But I think in terms of the success of treatment and coming back and all of that, it's going to certainly have a dramatic, I would think, impact. I would, I would just say that, you know, we didn't know about post-traumatic stress right. disorder. Right. It was called war neurosis. And for many years, the women who served in Vietnam were not eligible for that diagnosis because in the VA's light because you were required to have a combat infantryman's badge 
And, and of course, nurses didn't have that. So they were misdiagnosed. Right. The and one time it, women aren't allowed to be neurotic, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and many of them, uh, they also suffered. So in 1985, we, I was part of a study. I was an interviewer on a study in which uh, we asked women that, uh, who served in Vietnam for the very first time. It's a very interesting question. Um, were you ever in combat? Mm -hmm. And they, they said, no, never. Okay. Then the next question was, did you ever experience hostile fire? Mm -hmm. Invariably, they all said yes. How frequently? Well, every day. How close? And I remember <clears throat> one saying to me, well, I'm thinking they were firing about 50 yards away from uh, where I was, but she did not think of herself as being in combat, but the salient question right. was, how often have you experienced the sights and smells and sounds of death and dying? And I will remember one nurse saying, every minute, every day, every hour, for 365 days. And so from what we gleaned through that study, we actually documented that the nurses who served in Vietnam saw more death than the combat soldier. And that allowed them to be mm -hmm. diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. And I have to say that was one of the greatest victories that we passed on to this generation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bullard, what kind of success do we have now with treating post-traumatic stress? You know, the efficacy rates certainly vary, and I think with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, up to half of those who suffer it have comorbid diagnoses, major depression, anxiety, um, and unfortunately, the, the biggest problem is with substance abuse, so with alcohol and other, and other drugs, and that, that muddies the water. What also muddies the water is, is what we're seeing post-traumatic stress disorder? Is it mild traumatic brain injury? Is it both? Are people being correctly diagnosed? Are they being correctly treated? And so I think that depending on what you read, what population they're working with, the efficacy rates certainly vary. Let's talk a little bit about TBI. Um, Commissioner Schwartz, I've read that, you know, that's sort of the signature uh, injury of this war because it's um, caused in many cases by the kinds of uh, combat issues that the troops run into, mainly um, blast uh, concussions and, and injuries from blasts, IEDs and other things. Um, are we seeing a lot more people coming in for TBI, and are we diagnosing that um, right away? Well, let me say first that I am one who believes that every person that ever went to war and was next to a cannon did um, actually sustain a traumatic brain injury. We just did not pull it all together and Sorry. understand. And so some of the issues that the Civil War soldiers were enduring and we didn't understand, uh, and they were trying to self-medicate, they're still trying to do that. Absolutely. But let me say this. the. Um, our understanding of traumatic brain injury has really uh, been probably one of the greatest accomplishments of uh, the treatment of veterans today. And you are exactly right. The, the kind of combat and probably, I have to say this, the expertise of the, the treaters in the field to say, well, this is not exactly post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, this could be something else, and I am one who believes um, and has seen this, but let me just say that the, 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 one of the thinking that I ascribe to is the, the blast concussion, mm -hmm. in which someone sustains either the explosion, uh, and uh, it, it is not only just a racking of the brain, um, they are also, if you saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, there's a scene in the movie where Tom Hanks is in a firefight, he falls down, and when he gets up, he cannot hear and he cannot talk. Can you think of a more vulnerable position to be in than you can't talk, you can't hear, and somebody's trying to kill you? So many of the, much of the study and many of the veterans that I have encountered, they do have the overlay of the possible concussions because not only is that one blast a day, it's it could be five, six a day. Right. And they just get up and go out the next day and do it. So um, I think the, the overlay of the signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress 
they do, they do part ways in a way in which uh, the compensatory skills, and I think one of the good things, and I would one would be interested in your response, is that now we don't have to go through the, probing their post-traumatic stress. We can do interventions early enough, and it is my great hope that it will not become chronic PTSD. Right. I'd like to hear your response on that, too, about earlier interventions. Earlier interventions certainly make a difference, and I think more proper diagnosis. And I think the VA has done a tremendous job. I mean, the resources that have been devoted from the federal government to identifying traumatic brain injury are unparalleled. Um, people are, are diagnosed in the field, and I think with the blast, what you have is you've got this wave of air pressure that comes, and then there's negative pressure, and then there's a second wave that comes. And so you get a, a primary, you can have a primary injury just from the blast that can rattle your brain. And what we've learned is that the mechanism of injury is that it shears and, and works on shearing the axons, so it shears the connections between the cells. Then, if that didn't get you, then you might fall down and hit your head from that as well. Shrapnel could come and get you, or you would inhale something. There'd be fires. There'd be other toxins. So there's, there's, you know, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and the, you know, the sort of the fourth level. Um, and and then those symptoms that you get from a mild traumatic brain injury that that evolves into a post-concussive symptom look very similar to PTSD. Mm -hmm. You are irritable. You're anxious. You're tired. Um, you have problems with your sleep, um, concentration difficulties. And PTSD has many of those same symptoms. But in addition, and what folks are thinking is that perhaps it's sort of different ends of a spectrum, that you've got these mild traumatic brain injury and PTSD, they've got the hypervigilance. You're reliving. You're having flashbacks. Um, you, you're, it's not just that you can't sleep, you're having nightmares and terrors and sweating. And so they're wondering, is this on the same continuum? Mm -hmm. What we know too is if you've got this massive blast that comes in and disrupts your axons, there's certain areas of the brain that we know are, are vulnerable to that. And what we find is that the area that controls your inhibition to fear gets gets rattled and damaged, as well as the center of fear itself. So only here you have this magnified fear response, and you don't have the ability to modulate that. Um, and then on top of that, you just watched somebody get blown to bits, or now you're, you're, somebody looks very, that your squadron looks very, very different. And so you're, you're dealing with the effects of the concussion and the effects of the emotion at the same time. And so it's really hard to tease out. And so there's a lot of research, and I think it just comes down to what symptoms are you, per, you know, presenting with. Um, and the, the treatments are very good. We know that cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a form of, of psychotherapy, is the most efficacious and is in, often used and combined with medication, mm -hmm. um, antidepressants and things like that. Matt, do the soldiers' diaries or letters from the Civil War reflect that? Do they talk about any of those experiences? You know, they, it's, it's, that's a particularly interesting question because I was just at a, a discussion last week where one of the soldiers was writing home. We were going through this series of letters, and he kept saying to his brother, he said, I don't want you to join the army because one of us is enough. You know, we're doing our service. And he kept ending his letters with, he would say a few things, and then he would say, well, I just, I just can't tell you more now. I can't, I can't tell you what this is. I'll tell you when I come home. And so even at that time, and we, we connect this with the World War II generation especially, they didn't want to come home and retell their story. They didn't want others to have to live what they did. And there's a certain extent that Civil War soldiers did the same thing. And I think it's part of the culture in terms of this idea with what the, the commissioner said about the, you know, kind of gallants, you know, it, whether you're male or female now, that you have to be the hero and tough. And so they didn't engage this as much. But they do, if you read the letters carefully, you can see it in an offhanded way mm -hmm. that they're affected by this. And this particular soldier, uh, he went to war with his cousin and uh, two of his best friends. They had grown up together and all in a single day at Gettysburg, uh, one of them is right next to him, shot in the head. One of them, or the other two are both injured and he escapes unscathed. And so now you get into the whole issue of survivor skills. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing. I want to see if anybody in the audience has a question that they'd like to ask to the panelists. Um, I haven't been uh, paying that much attention to you because it's been so interesting. But would anybody like to ask a question? Yes, sir. 
I have a question related to the culture differences of enemies. You know, to a large extent, the warrior concept is men and women to the, uh, women and children to, to the rear, men front, and you fight the war that way, World War II, Korea. But Vietnam was very different because our soldiers were fighting women and children. And I would think that would have a tremendous psychological impact on people uh, engaged in that kind of a conflict. And with Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq, the same thing is the culture difference that significantly affects our troops. And, and I don't know of the research on that, and perhaps you do, but I think that's probably, too, why post-traumatic stress became such a, such a, a difficulty in the Vietnam era. Uh, because this was a different type of war, um, and you, you know you're engaging women and children, and, and I, you know, how do you come home from that? You know, that's you weren't grown. It's so foreign to, you know, how you're raised, and so that had to have contributed. And I admit I don't know the literature, and I haven't read about that as to how people experience that and the trauma, and it had to just magnify it. Yeah, I, I've become very interested in that idea yeah. from a, from another angle, and that is. We have been dealing for quite a long time in this country with civilian armies. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you would be able to reach, research this. I think it would probably be impossible. What about other cultures that have been raised as warrior cultures and their business has been mm -hmm. to engage in warfare? Would they experience the same you know, percentage or levels of traumas as more civilians yeah. who haven't been raised with that idea right. of combat. And Matt, I wonder in particular with, as uh, the commissioner mentioned, uh, so many National Guard being involved and being deployed, yeah. and then you're sent home and you go back to your job as a plumber, and then the next thing you know you're back in combat again, and then you're supposed to come back and go back to your job at the insurance company, and then you're going back again. Um, so you're living this really, uh, particularly for people today who are getting multiple deployments, they're living this sort of schizophrenic, and I don't mean that in a, in a medical way, but they're living this schizophrenic existence. They, they really don't have any time to decompress from the experience. And I would say as far as this, the fighting in Vietnam, you know, there were no safe places. We didn't have bases, and um, everyone was the enemy. And I think many of our soldiers who uh, really, you have to understand that the average age, average age, of a soldier in Vietnam was 18. And they were drafted. And many of them uh, did not have, you know, did, I, I think in many respects, uh, the, the issues of not knowing who the enemy was um, and also the fact that uh, we, we did find, I will tell you one interesting aspect of the study I worked on was that we found that the nurses who were reporting, this is several, this is like 10 years later, had less symptoms of post-traumatic stress than the other women who were not nurses who were much younger. Because nurses, we deal with life and death. But these ladies, they were typists and clerks and, and air traffic controllers. They never saw it before. And so it was very profound. That's an interesting answer to what yeah. you, that I thought about. That's a really interesting well, answer. And it fuels the hypervigilance. If you're out in, you know, if you're out in the field and you're trained that anybody could be the enemy, and now you're plopped out back home into a somewhat, obviously, a hostile environment, and anybody on the street, and you're trained that way, and it just fuels that, that hypervigilance and that arousal and that physiologic reaction that comes along with the PTSD. We, we have gotten, especially from now, it's very similar. The one thing that's a little different from Iraq is, if you think about this, uh, in the patrols that we were doing, that you could be going down the very same street where you saw somebody just get it, uh, you know, be destroyed by a bomb or something like that, but you're still going down that same road. And I, uh, the other thing, and I would just say this on behalf of the women, women are much more in front and center as far as danger goes. Many of them have manned weapons and guns and turrets. And um, I've had the experience when they come home, just as so you talked about the hypervigilance, one of them is relating to me how harrowing the trip from Bradley Airport was through Hartford because they were looking at the overpasses, looking at the side, 
waiting to see if there was something that might explode. And we had a couple of them uh, come to me and ask me if um, they, they said, you, you must know the Attorney General. And I said, yes. And I said, did you get a speeding ticket? And they said, yes. I said, what were you doing? A hundred. He said, I was driving 160 miles an hour down 91. And he said it never even occurred to him. It was just that is the way life was where he was. And I told him, I'm not even sure the attorney general can help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> one or two more questions. Would anyone like to? Uh, yes, sir. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but is the issue that we send such young people to fight our wars and they, and they don't have stable lives when they go and they tend to be maybe a little marginalized in society before they go, the guys that elect to enlist, is that part of the issue? Many people would want you to think that. But if the military was doing their job, they would have screened them just as well as they did during World War II. Many people were uh, declared unfit, and that is when we first began to see how much mental illness there was actually in the general population. But that is not, that is a luxury that many of our people that have been deployed, many of the people who were sent to Vietnam and many of who are deployed today has not had a screening. And, and so let me just say that from my experience, and perhaps you would agree, Maybe there was something that happened in, a, in their life before they joined the military. But you cannot join the military. You cannot serve in that kind of a society and not go away changed. And so sometimes things can be accentuated, feelings and emotions. And um, it, is, uh, it is sad when people want to say that the reason this individual has, who has served in combat, has post-traumatic stress is because of something that happened to them when they were six years old. That's a real cop-out. Well, and I think you raise a good point. 18 is young, right? 18 is very, very young. But at the same token, would 25 insulate you any better from a good family from a blast injury or from the horrors of war? No. Um, you may have a different support system when you returned home, but you're still going to, 10 to 20 percent, suffer from a concussion in the field uh, in the last, in the Iraq and Afghanistan. And so that's going to predispose them to PTSD right there and then. So I don't know that if we had an older 20s and 25-year-olds and it was composed differently, you're still going to have the same number of blast injuries. You're still going to have the same, probably, incidence of PTSD. Um, I think where you're going to see the difference is perhaps on the other end in terms of treatment, but that's just a, a random guess. One last question. No, nope. I'm going to ask then that, uh, that each of you uh, give us a final thought, and Matt, I'll start with you. Um, I, I think that the idea of calling this issue or calling this syndrome or calling this problem soldier's heart really gets to me because it, I, to me it's a little bit about breaking someone's heart. It is. I, I don't think that you can read the letters and diaries of these soldiers during the Civil War period or uh, their family members and not realize that these, these young men have had their hearts broken. They've watched just total mayhem all around them. And uh, I, I've come to just through studying the history to have such a greater appreciation for what our soldiers do today. I really have, it's increased my respect for, for what they do on a daily basis more than, I, I mean, I've always had a sense of respect, but not until I really jumped into this history did I, did I fully kind of appreciate what they, they go through. Dr. Bullard? Yeah, obviously I'd have to agree. Um, and I think, too, that the, some of the issues facing the soldiers, perhaps in the Civil War, the injury from falling off your horse, getting whacked with a sword, um, and then today a lot of it's invisible, you know, blast injuries. Some of them don't even know they've been injured, um, right? You know, so it's, but it's very similar. Their hearts are still broken. Um, but there's, there's an added component as, as we've evolved in terms of our warfare. Commissioner Schwartz, I'd like you to have the final word. I agree that um, the term soldier's heart 
does quantify and conceptualize what really is going on here. And I believe uh, that it is accentuated by the fact that when our soldiers come home, they do not receive the help that they need. Um, this is a constant challenge to me, of course, and uh, but I believe that uh, too many of the systems want them to fit into the system. They don't want to actually respond to their needs. And that is even more heartbreaking. And in many respects, I think that was what happened after the Vietnam War, that people were expecting uh, not, I don't think they were expecting parades, but I think they were expecting not to have to fight to get the care that they need. And I'm sorry to say, in some respects, it still continues today, that they have to fight for the care that they need. Commissioner, if there is a veteran out there who's watching this television program today who feels that they need help, what do you tell them to do? I tell them to give me a call. I'll give you, I'll give you my office number, which is 866-616-3603. Um, I may be the commissioner, but I'm still a nurse, and we in Connecticut have a fine network of folk that will be here to help them. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here for this program. Thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. I think this has been one of those moments where you can see how science and history and culture, all of these things come together in a very complex issue that is so important to talk about. And um, I really appreciated that. I've just spent the last couple of days with my uncle, who's a World War II veteran, talking about a lot of these things. And um, so it was very special for me personally. Um, I hope that you will all come back to join us to discuss other complex issues. On uh, November 14th at 6 o'clock, we're going to be having a program here. It will be a town hall meeting about civic health in Connecticut. And I think you might find that our civic health is good in some ways and not so good in others. Um, we hope that by presenting programs like this, we hope to increase civic health in Connecticut. Um, and we know that everybody has opinions about our health, about our, our politics, our situation in Connecticut. And we hope that you can come and join us on November 14th at 6 o'clock. And I thank you very much for joining us here today. I ask you to please fill out your um, surveys for, and give us ideas for future programs. And again, thank you to Diane and the panel.